<laughs> We're improvising today. I call the House Education Finance Committee to order. Um, welcome. Good morning. Big day today. We have the Education Finance Bill rollout, so we're going to get started. Um, our first order of business is to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Representative Purcell, have you had a chance to look at the March 24th minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm reviewing the minutes from our previous meeting, and I move their approval. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Purcell. Um, Representative Purcell moves the approval of the minutes for March 24th. Any questions? Or is it March 23rd? Sorry. It should be the 24th. It should be the 24th. We will correct that on the agenda. So the, the minutes that are in front of you say the 23rd. They're really the 24th. So we move the approval of the minutes for March 24th. All the, any other questions on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The minutes are adopted. Um, thank you very much, folks. And next up, I'm going to be walking through the House Education Finance Bill. Our pages have requested that everybody keep the bill and the DE3 amendment, D1 amendment, and the spreadsheets together and put them back in your folder or write your name on it. If you want to take the spreadsheets, that's the one thing we could probably make copies of quick. But as you can see, we would not want to make copies of the entire bill quickly for folks. So let's save a tree and keep them in your folder. Um, with that, I'm going to hand the gavel over to um, Vice Chair Clardy as I present the bill. Good morning, Chair Yukim. Would you like to move House File 2497 before the committee? Yes, Madam Chair, that would be my motion. Would you like to move the DE1 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move the DE1 amendment. You may go ahead and present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just like um, although we no. are... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, members... Um, Thank you. The DE1 amendment's in front of you, and this is our education finance bill that we'll be working off of. Members, this bill was crafted by you all. It was crafted by the Education Finance Committee and the Education Policy Committee. With this proposal, we make historic investments in our schools. We ensure that the learning environments in our schools, communities, work for all of our students, and that our teachers, principals, and administrators have the tools they need to meet students where they're at. We've had over 20 years of underinvestment in our schools. While we cannot change that overnight or even in one biennium, this is an incredible start. Our proposal stabilizes school funding, supports the health and well-being of our students, works on equity and innovation in our schools, increases career pathways and connections with local communities, as well as building up and diversifying our workforce. I would like to thank each and every one of the members of this committee and the House Education Policy Committee. I would like to thank Vice Chair Clardy, Chair Pryor, and Vice Chair Hill for spending so much quality time over the last few weeks, and especially this weekend, putting this bill together. Along with our CA, Polly Sirk-Benick, and our researcher, Mars, Mars beltrami Remquist, and our absolutely amazing nonpartisan staff. You really cannot go wrong with having Tim Strom, Christina Parra, and Salve Beckel working on, you, working on legislation with you. The brain power between the three of them is astounding. I would like to thank Minority Lead Krisha for meeting with me almost every week to discuss the agendas and researcher Jody Withers for working with our staff. Members in this bill, you'll find investments in our schools to stabilize their budgets so they can plan for the future. I'm not gonna go line by line, but we'll hit some of the highlights before we walk through the bill. Using the base of Representative Norris's bill, we index the formula to inflation and increase that formula by 4% the first year and 2% the second. 2% the second. While we scale back uh, Representative Wogelmott's bill, we still tackle 50% of the special education cross subsidy and by 2027 tackle 100% of the English learner cross subsidy with Representative Hur's proposal. And with Representative Hill's bill, we increased the transportation sparsity aid from 18.2% to 40% to 
to help school districts who have to transport students long distances. We also make substantial investment in our youngest learners the year before kindergarten to set them up for success. In this bill, there are a variety of ways we invest in the health and well-being of our students. We put millions of dollars into the expansion of full-service community schools with the provision by Representative Vang. We include Representative Berg's bill to increase our school support staff, social workers, counselors, psychologists, and school nurses, and we include an investment in a pipeline for that workforce that was brought to us by Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. We use an entire article in this bill to focus on literacy, using Representative Edelson's READ Act as a base. I would like to personally thank her for her countless hours she's put into making the, to, to put into constructing the READ Act and blending it with gover the go governor's bold literacy proposal so that the package works for our students and our schools. There's also money included in that package for teacher training as well as curriculum grants. There are a variety of innovative ways that we invest in our school's academic climate with grants to groups like the Bar Center and Math Corps. We provide funding to help schools teach the upcoming social studies standards in areas of Holocaust and ethnic studies as well as begin work around financial literacy and computer science. We build connections with community by investing in after school programming, community education, adult basic education, and our regional county libraries regional and county libraries. We also make investments in career and technical education for a variety of careers from EMS and STEM to aviation and ground transportation. We also include Representative Purcell's bill to provide additional money to our consortiums across the state to coordinate increased investments in CTE programming. This bill provides money for our school's infrastructure, both human and physical. There are dollars to increase teachers of color and indigenous teachers in our classroom as well as increasing our workforce in special education. This bill also provides unemployment insurance for the hourly workers in our schools. We provide money to Professional Educators Licensing and Standards Board to streamline the portfolio process and policy to make it easier for teachers to stay in the classroom in areas where there's shortages. We also provide money to increase training for our paraprofessionals, our ESPs, and provide added time for our special education teachers to complete IEPs. And finally, we provide funding to the Minnesota Department of Education to build up our MTSS and COMPASS program and develop an officer of Inspec Office of Inspector General to increase oversight of the state dollars that are going into our schools. Members, this bill is well-rounded and balanced. It reflects every corner of our state and is a product that we can be very proud of. With that, I'll turn things over to Ms. Beckel, Mr. Strom, and Ms. Para to walk through the spreadsheets in the bill language. We'll go through the spreadsheets and then ask if folks have clarifying questions. And then as uh, we walk through the language, we can stop after ed every article to see if there's qu clarifying questions as well. With that, I will turn this over to Ms. Beckel. Ms. Beckel. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Solvay Beckel, House Fiscal. Uh, if you turn to the spreadsheet with the title 2023 Legislature, K-12 through House Education Finance Omnibus, 2023 February Forecast, HF 2497-DE1. Columns A through C are the February forecast, and then columns D through M uh, show the House file 2497-DE1. Um, bill. Lines four through seven show the formula allowance um, information. So that just states that the formula allowance in fiscal year 24 would be increased to 7,138 per pupil. Um, and then in 25, 7,281, 26, 7,425, and 27, 7,586. And so those are the only numbers basically in this spreadsheet that are not in thousands. All right. Uh, in Article 1, the general education base funding for um, the general, sorry, for the general education funding, um, these numbers will be filled in in the author's amendment. Um, but there are a number of changes made. So starting on line 10, there is an average daily membership adjustment for children with disabilities 
This has a cost of 140 million in the first biennium, excuse me, 140,000 in the first biennium and 152,000 in the second. Line 11, English learner aid for uh, early childhood special education students, a cost of 1.083 million in the first biennium and 1.385 million in the second biennium. Line 12, the English learner cross subsidy reduction aid. Um, this has been funded at 81.77 million in the first biennium um, at um, an increase in the uh, formula uh, for calculating EL aid um, in the first year um, or on the entire formula. So, but then the cross subsidy has been reduced by 0% in fiscal year 24, 33% in fiscal year 25, 66% in fiscal year 26 and 100% in fiscal year 2027 and the cost for that then in the tails is $272.015 million. Line 13, uh, the compensatory <coughs> revenue formula change. This does not have a cost in the first biennium but it costs $20.658 million in the tails. Uh, line 14 uh, is just in there to show the cost from House File 5, the universal meals change, but this is not counted in this bill. Line 15, extended time revenue for residential treatment facilities, so that is for juvenile justice or mental health treatment facilities. This has a cost of 1.283 million in the first biennium and 1.395 million in the second biennium. Line 16, the formula allowance increase of 4% in 24 and 2% in 25, and then indexing the formula to inflation in fiscal year 2026 and later. This has a cost of 704.996 million in the first biennium and 1.344369 billion in the tails. There are some interactions when it comes to the uh, general education formula allowance and the EL cross subsidy reduction. Um, so these are shown on lines 18, 19, and 20. The EL aid for early childhood special education students and the EL cross subsidy reduction when um, both done as in this bill have a cost of 912,000 in the first biennium and 2.171 million in the second biennium. Uh, targeted pre-K, um, the voluntary pre-kindergarten seats that are included in this bill which will be uh, discussed um, when I get to article 10. Um, the cost of those and the basic formula increase, which I discussed on line 16, have a cost of 4.886 million in the first biennium and 14.596 in the second biennium. Uh, line 20, targeted pre-K, the VPK seats and the EL cross subsidy reduction have an interaction cost of 2.778 million in the first biennium and 19.213 million in the second biennium. Line 21, um, I, we may be um, adjusting this number um, as, as we move. Um, I'm not sure I did this properly. I apologize. This is the levy equalization. Um, because this committee has a zero levy target, meaning that uh, it is the goal not to increase property tax levies via any legislation in this bill, um, this is the bill buying down any costs um, that otherwise would have been borne via levy. So the cost of that would be around 19.77 million in, in the first biennium and 39.61 million in the second biennium. Line 22, uh, menstrual products and naloxone in schools uh, would have a cost of 3.628 million in the first biennium and 3.682 million in the second biennium. Line 23, online learning aid for Bureau of Indian Education students. This provision has a cost of 6,000 in each biennium. Line 24, special instruction extended to age 22 
Um, this has a cost in the general education formula and in the special education um, regular appropriate regular aid. Um, so the cost in general education here is eight is excuse me uh, nine point six million roughly in the first biennium and ten point one million in the second biennium. Line twenty five, uh, the targeted pre kindergarten program, which again. Um, in this just entails VPK seats, um, and by VPK I mean voluntary pre-kindergarten, just for reference here. This has a cost of 85.285 million in uh, the first biennium and 154.986 million uh, in the tails. And it just occurred to me that I do not separate this out in Article 10, so I should probably explain that. The bill, um, Increases the bill extends the 4,000 VPK seats um, that were otherwise set to expire in fiscal year 24, and then it increases the number of seats in fiscal year 25 uh, to uh, by 5,200. So the total number of additional seats um, in fiscal year 24 is 4,000 and 25, 9,200, and it and then that is ongoing in the tails. So 26 and 27, 9,200 seats ongoing. Uh, finally, transportation sparsity revenue. This has a cost of 10.5 million roughly in the first biennium and 13 million in the tails. And that is general education. Um, the other general education programs, which you'll see have their own appropriations later on in the bill. Um, here, uh, I am just going to go over the changes in the bill and not the base uh, funding. When I say base funding, if you look at columns I and M, if those columns have a zero, um, that means that that item either wasn't funded or that's base funding. Uh, all of the new proposals I have endeavored to um, indent on uh, the left-hand side here, so if that is indented um, it should be a new program, um, but some of these items are uh, the governor's proposals, but I've uh, made the spreadsheet a bit shorter here so that it is easier to see. You can look at the other spreadsheet for the governor's proposals. Okay, line 32, uh, career and technical education uh, EMS course grants is funded at one million a biennium, line 33. Career and Technical Education Transportation Pilot Program is funded at 450,000 one time in fiscal year 24. Line 39, non-public pupil education aid has been increased by 723,000 in the first biennium and 1.4 mil million in the second biennium. <coughs> Line 41, non-public pupil transportation um, has also been increased due to the formula interaction by 2.9 million in the first biennium and 7.7 7, uh, million in the second biennium. Line 45, the Rural Career and Technical Education Consortium uh, has increased funding. It was at 3 million each year, and now it will receive 5 million each year with a 2 million increase. Uh, 40, line 46, transportation for ALC students, that receives two million per biennium. That was Article 1. We're moving now to Article 2, education excellence. Line 54, there is a VPK interaction here as well. Achievement and integration aid receives an increase of 630,000 in the first biennium and 1.013 million in the tails. Uh, line 57, the Building Assets Reducing Risks Center receives an appropriation of $5 million in fiscal year 24 only, available until June 30, 2026. Line 61, there is another VPK interaction, this time for Charter School Building Lease Aid. Uh, this has an increase of $1.03 million in, in the first biennium and $1.7 roughly million in the tails. Line 65, Computer Science Education Advancement. This receives a million uh, each biennium. Line 66, Computer Science uh, STEAM Grants. This receives one million per biennium. 
Line 70, the Educational Outcome and Accountability Pilot. This receives 90,000 in fiscal year 24 and 25 only. Line 72, the Ethnic Studies Grants. This receives 2 million a biennium. Line 73, Full Service Community Schools. This receives 27.532 million in the first biennium and 25.298 million in the second biennium. Line 74, the Genocide and Holocaust Education Requirement. This is being funded at 150,000 per biennium. Line 75, Girls Taking Action. This receives 1.5 million in fiscal year 24 only. Line 78, the Minnesota Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs. This receives a one-time appropriation of uh, 2.5 million in the first biennium split over the two years. Okay, uh, line 79, uh, MAP Stars receives 50,000 one time in fiscal year 24. Line 80, the Minnesota Center for the Book receives 200,000 per year ongoing. Line 83, the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations receives an increase of 316,000 per year ongoing. Line 86, the Minnesota Math Core Program uh, receives 500,000 in additional funding per year for a total of 1 million per year ongoing. Uh, line 89, the multi-tiered systems of support program recommended by the governor receives funding for the CARI uh, program at the U of M, grants to schools, and the MDE, uh, for, and MDE and the service cooperatives for implementation, as well as the Regional Math Network and Summer Math Institute. And those are funded at uh, 2 million, 10 million, 14 million, and 10.5 million per biennium, respectively. Uh, excuse me, in the first biennium only, respectively. Line 96, uh, non-exclusionary discipline. This is funded at 1.75 million per year ongoing. Line 97, paraprofessional paid orientation. Uh, this receives 15.869 million in the first biennium and 16.672 million in the second biennium. Line 102, the Sané Foundation. This receives 1.5 million ongoing. Uh, then that brings us down to the Read Act, Bold Literacy. Uh, the changes that were uh, adopted in the House version of this are uh, visible on lines 113. Again, the, an appropriation for the Center for Applied Research and Educational Improvement, or CARI, 4.2 million in fiscal year 24 only. Line 116, curriculum and instructional materials, 40 million in fiscal year 24 only. These materials are available for more than just fiscal year 24. Um, line 120, uh, MDE grant administration receives 250,000 in fiscal year 24. Line 121, the MDE literacy specialist is funded at 250,000 per year ongoing. Line 122, the regional literacy networks receive 18 million in fiscal year 24. Um, zero and 25, um, and then they receive 3 million ongoing in fiscal years 26 and 27. Uh, line 123, statewide training, receives funding of 9.2 million in 24. And line 124, uh, substitute teachers and incentives for teacher <coughs> training uh, is funded at $1 million in fiscal year 24. The next article, American Indian Education. The American Indian Education aid is increased by 12.974 million in fiscal year 24 and 25, and increased by 14.751 million in the tails. Line 131, the American Indian Teacher Training Program um, is increased by 1.61 million in fiscal year 24, and that is also um, transferred to a special revenue fund. So those funds will no longer cancel to the general fund at the end of the biennium. If there are remaining funds left over, they'll be put into a special revenue fund. Line 132, native language revitalization grants. Those are funded at 7.5 million per year. Line 134, tribal contract schools formula allowance increase. Uh, that increase is 531,000 in the first biennium, 
and 1.023 million in the second biennium. That brings us down to the teacher's <coughs> article. Uh, here on line 141, we have a targeted pre-K or VPK alternative teacher comp interaction. Uh, this has a cost of 1.662 million in the first biennium and 2.923 million in the tails. Line 142, I apologize, I did not get that one uh, indented, but this is uh, new funding. So Black Men Teach receives uh, 500,000 each year ongoing. Line 144 uh, is a Come Teach in MN uh, Minnesota fiscal year 24 adjustment. Um, so uh, the 200,000 that was appropriated for fiscal year 24 is just uh, reduced to zero. Line 149, the Grow Your Own program receives an increase of 17 million per year ongoing. Line 151, the licensure shortage areas um, program receives funding of 10 million per year ongoing. Line 156, student support personnel aid receives funding of 25 million in 24, 50 million in 25, and then 75 million in both years of the tails. Line 158, the student support personnel workforce pipeline receives separate funding of five million per year ongoing. Line 162, teacher residency program, receives three million per year ongoing. This is the Pelsby section of teachers. Line 164, alternative pathways to licensure support position. This is funded at 150,000 per year ongoing. Line 165, barriers to teacher licensure removed. This is a one-time funding item of 77,000 in fiscal year 24. <coughs> Line 167, the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educators of Color grants receive an increase of five million per year ongoing, so that the funding for this program is six million per year total. Line 168, heritage language and culture teachers increased. This receives 208,000 ongoing. Line 169, licensure via portfolio. This uh, is funded at 150,000 per year ongoing. Line 170, uh, licensure pathway preparation grants. Uh, this is funded at 400,000 per year ongoing. Line 171, the Pelsby board membership and stipend. This is funded at 67,000 per year ongoing. Line 172, Reports on increasing teachers of color. This is funded at 60,000 per year ongoing. Line 174, the teachers of color mentoring and retention program receives an increase of 504,000 each year, making the, uh, oh, excuse me, of 504,000 in the first biennium and 15, excuse me, 1.504 million per year in the tails, making the total appropriation <coughs> for this program 3.5 million per year in the first biennium and 4.5 million per year in the tails. Line, one point, line 176, the uh, recruitment marketing campaign receives an increase of 250,000 per year, making the total appropriation 500,000 per year. That brings us down to the special education article. Line 182, separate sites and programs aid for settings four and higher. Uh, receives 9.461 million in the first biennium and 10.941 million in the tails. Line 184, special education due process preparation time. This is funded at 50, uh, roughly 50 million in the first biennium and uh, 35.4 million in the tails. Then on line 186, this is the special education regular funding and all of those items uh, indented underneath it are rolled up into that appropriation in the bill um, when you're looking at the bill itself. Um, but so included in that is on line 187, the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf Certified Interpreters that has a cost of 268,000 in the first biennium and 610,000 the second biennium. 188, Special Education Cross-Subsidy Reduction Aid 
Uh, this is being funded uh, at the same levels as the governor, <coughs> and this has a cost of $729,863,000 in the first biennium and $843,726,000 in the second biennium. Line 189, the Special Education Homeless Student Transportation uh, Program receives $2.477 million in the first biennium and about, two, and about $3 million in the tails. Line 190, the Special Education Foster Student Transportation uh, receives $519,000 in the first biennium and about $1.2 million in the tails. Line 191, I had mentioned this earlier in the Gen Ed area, uh, the special instruction extension to age 22. Now this is just the special education funding portion of that. So that has a cost of 34,000 in the first biennium <coughs> and 78,000 in the second biennium. And finally, there is a targeted pre-K, voluntary pre-kindergarten, special education cost or interaction. And that um, costs 2.954 million in the first biennium and 5.421 million in the tails. I promise we're getting there. Uh, moving on to the next article, uh, facilities. Line 197, um, building and cybersecurity grants. This is funded at 35 million uh, in fiscal year 24 and available through 2027. Line 200, gender neutral bathroom grants. Uh, these receive two million per biennium. Line 203, targeted pre-K, voluntary pre-kindergarten, this interaction with long-term facilities maintenance, equalization aid. This has a cost of 596,000 in the first biennium and 1.051 million in the second biennium. Nutrition, uh, line 210, breakfast aid for early childhood special education students. This has a cost of 158,000 in the first biennium and second biennium. And then line 211, the VPK school breakfast cost is 857,000 in the first biennium and 1.5-ish million in the tails. Line 214, the school lunch VPK cost is uh, 286,000 in the first biennium and 504,000 in the tails. And you can see on lines 212 and 215, I have the bracketed out numbers for the universal meals, um, which is now uh, 2023 session chapter 18. It's already, already in law. All right, moving down to libraries. Line two, 221. The basic system support regional libraries uh, receives an increase of 4.18 in the first biennium and 4.4 million in the second biennium. Line 224, the multi-county multi-type library systems receive an increase of 285,000 in the first biennium and 300,000 in the second biennium. Uh, that brings us down to community education. So line 239, the Adults with Disabilities program receives an increase of 1.083 in the first biennium and 2.406 in the second biennium. Line 237, the after school program grants or IGNITE receives 25 million in fiscal year 24 only, but available through 27. Line 239, the community education uh, program receives an increase as well of 1.98 million in the first year and 3.96 million uh, sorry, of 1.98 million in the first biennium and 3.96 million in the tails. Line 243, the Education Partnership Program Tier 2 Implementing Grants uh, receives an increase of 220,000 per year ongoing. Line 250, the high school equivalency tests are increased by 490,000 in fiscal year 2024 only, but are available. Uh, through 2027. That brings us down to the state agencies. Line 263, uh, MDE is given funding for athletic uh, race and ethnicity data collection. That's funded at 180,000 in the first biennium and 130,000 in the second. Line 264, audit and internal control resources. 
uh, MDE is given funding uh, at 800000 per year ongoing for this. Line 278 um, is the operating adjustment. This has a cost of $9.596 million in the first biennium and $9.984 million in the tails. Line 281, reasonable, reasonable force reporting IT costs. This is 47000 in fiscal year 24 only. Yay. Line 284, specific learning disability criteria change. This has a cost of 573000 ongoing. Line 288, uh, unemployment insurance administration fees. Um, this administration costs, rather, um, this has a cost of 450000 in the first biennium and 350000 in the second biennium. Um, the universal school meals, again, already uh, passed into law, of course, but those are just those costs bracketed out. Um, line 292, the Board of School Administrators receives an increase of 64000 per year. Line 294, the EdFi data collection system and data reporting receives 3.2-ish million in the first biennium and 4.7-ish million in the tails. <clears throat> Line 295, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Center receives staffing funding at $2 million per year ongoing. Line 300, uh, the litigation fees change, so $1.5 million is canceled in the 22-23 biennium, and $7.5 million is appropriated in fiscal year 24 for a net cost of six million. Line 301, uh, a mental health services lead has a cost of 150,000 per <coughs> year. And line 303, the Office of the Inspector General is funded at two million per year ongoing. Last page, almost. Line 310. <laughs> Uh, Pelsby receives an operating increase of 538000 in the first biennium and 682000 in the second biennium. Then moving down to the Minnesota State Academies, uh, line 315, they receive money for the audiology <coughs> booth and equipment at 125000 in fiscal year 24 only. Line 316, uh, the State Academies receive uh, funding for the mental health day treatment program which is 630000 in the first biennium and 370000 in the second. Line 317, they receive an operating increase of $3.6 in the first biennium and $4.1 in the tails. Line 318, um, they receive money for a safety and security technology initiative of $1.265 in the first biennium and $825 million in the tails. <coughs> And then line 319, the state academies receive um, unemployment insurance eligibility expansion funding of 642000 in the first biennium and the second biennium. Moving down to Perpich, on line 324, Perpich receives funding for classroom furniture at 300000 in the first in fiscal year 24. On line 325, they receive funding for dormitory furniture on in fiscal year 20. In fiscal year 24 at 850000 On line 326, they receive an operating increase of $1.4 in the first biennium and $1.8 in the tails. And on line 137, they receive funding of $24,000 per year ongoing for unemployment insurance eligibility expansion. Um, and as you look at columns I and E, I, and M, um, you can see that the increase over base is uh, two, for fiscal years 22 through 25 is 2 billion 213 million 647 thousand and for fiscal years 26 through 27 it is 3 billion 199 million 592 thousand and then the final page simply shows transfers to the special revenue fund that were referenced earlier. Um, 
no longer putting money from the mental health day treatment into the special revenue fund. It's just a general fund item now. And um, providing expenditure authority for the online learning fee spending authority for the Minnesota Department of Education. And Madam Chair, that is the spreadsheet. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Becco, for all your hard work. Um, are there any questions on the spreadsheet? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to Tim Strom. Madam Chair and members, in your packets is the DE1 amendment. Uh, that's the document we'll be working off of. The bill summary hopefully will be ready relatively soon today, and uh, uh, Mr. Kvenick will post that as soon as it's available to her. Uh, the bill is organized into 13 articles. I'll be speaking to Article 1 first with a very high-level summary, and it's my understanding the chair prefers questions directed either to the author or technical questions to staff at the end of each article. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In Article 1, uh, Sections 1 and 2 have to do requir with requirements for school boards. Uh, uh, section 1 requires the distribution of menstrual products. Uh, section 2 requires uh, at least two doses of uh, opiate antagonists to be at each uh, uh, school site. Section 3 is the publication of the bond election date being moved 48 days before the election at the earliest. Uh, section four is the provision that gives the school boards control for non-public transportation to negotiate an agreement about how that transportation is provided. Section five is slightly different than the language this committee saw for the ALC transportation. The reimbursement remains in place, but that reimbursement is capped at a million dollars per year. Uh, so should the overall cost of that exceed a million dollars, district's ALC transportation amounts would be prorated. Uh, uh, section 6 increases the statewide CTE consortium, as was heard in this committee, from 3 to $5 million. Uh, section 7 uh, is the expansion of English learner funding for ECSE students without that counting against the students' seven years of combined funding. Uh, uh, section 8 is the increase in English learner revenue. There's two parts to this. Starting in fiscal year 24, the basic amount goes from $704 per EL learner to $1,000 per English learner. And uh, that continues uh, in subsequent years. And then starting in FY25, the cross-subsidy is aid is... Uh, increased uh, starting at 33% in 25, going to 66% in 26, and reaching 100% of the cross subsidy for 27 and later. Section 9 spends the bulk of the money in the bill. This is the increase in the formula allowance that Ms. Beckel described. It's a 4% increase the first year, an additional 2% in the second year, and then for following years linked to the uh, increase in inflation. Section 10 is extended time for care and treatment, uh, extended to both those that are uh, day treatment as well as those that are residential treatment facilities. Sections 11 and 18 are essentially the places where the, and there are still blanks in the DE amendment, this is where the levy balancing will occur to ensure that this committee has uh, uh, meets its zero levy target. Uh, there are several changes related to compensatory revenue. The first three that are in sections 12 to 14 are part of the governor's recommendation for uh, ensuring that there's no loss in compensatory revenue due to the uh, school meals for all program. The governor's revised language for this began in fiscal 25. The House bill in front of you uh, starts the governor's uh, revised language in 26 and continues with the language that was passed in Chapter 18, the Free Meals Bill for fiscal year 25. Um, the next substantive section is Section 20. This is the pupil transportation sparsity currently set at 18.2% of the unfunded transportation costs. The bill proposes to increase to uh, 40%. Uh, the next 
uh, three provisions have to do with compensatory revenue uses, uh, the reporting and the building allocation. Those are relatively similar to what these the committee saw in Representative Feist's bills. The uses have been broadened slightly uh, uh, since the language from Representative Feist was here, and the building allocation was reduced uh, uh, from what was in that bill to 60% uh, staying at the site. Uh, uh, the reporting language is relatively the same as you've seen before. Section 24 is Fraser's provision, Representative Fraser's provision to renew operating referendum by school board action. Um, then there's a series of uh, uh, unemployment insurance provisions which are in sections 25, 27, 28, 29, and in a couple of the uh, appropriations riders. What, House, what the Delete Everything Amendment proposes to do is require that the, ex, the summer term employees uh, be eligible for unemployment insurance. So hourly workers during the summer term, if they're uh, uh, laid off, would be uh, eligible for unemployment insurance. Uh, uh, the, uh, so the eligibility is in place there, and then the later sections deal only with the funding for the state agencies uh, that would have increased costs be because of that. I should add that the, that the language writing in this bill in terms of the exclusion also applies to the higher education workers. Uh, so the full amount of Representative Greenman's uh, requirements essentially are, are writing with this bill. Uh, Sections 26 and 27 were the language that Representative Newton brought on the uh, school trust fund uh, offices, qualifications, and duties. Uh, section 30 was uh, the assigning the tax credit, just a change the governor has proposed the last couple of years uh, for the administrative side of that. Um, uh, finally, a couple of uncodified provisions. Uh, uh, in section 32, Representative Hansen's uh, fund transfer for the Burnsville School District. Uh, section 33 was the provision in Representative Feist's bill for the study of whether eliminating all of the, what are commonly referred to as the paper forms, the non-direct match uh, eligibility for free lunch, whether the forms could be eliminated or not. That's just essentially a reporting requirement for the department. Um, and sections, uh, 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 section 34, as Ms. Beckel mentioned in the uh, overview, uh, uh, the uh, uh, language in the bill, or I'm, so, I'm sorry, that was at the earlier hearing this morning for early childhood, apologies. The, each of the bills this year is carrying a provision of the omnibus bill saying that a, a, an item of appropriation is given effect only once. And that's in case uh, there, there's uh, some years there's, there's more overlap between subject areas. And this provision essentially would ensure that if the same provision were in two omnibus bills, that its effect is, it only happens once. Uh, this in, for purposes of this committee's purpose, if there are provisions in the early childhood bill that would be the same as those in this bill, then, then only one of those appropriations would be effective essentially. Um, section 35 is new language that this committee hasn't seen before and has to do with the uh, 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 review of grants. Uh, there's a couple of parts of this. The, when we get to the agency funding, the, uh, uh, the Delete Everything Amendment establishes the Office of Inspector General. The, that office is given uh, review requirements uh, for, for grant applications. Um, and there's also general language regarding the ability of, uh, of the uh, uh, agency to uh, ask for financial and other information for each grantee uh, before awarding, awarding grants. There may be some effort to standardize that language across all, uh, uh, all omnibus bills as, as this bill moves through ways and means. Uh, finally, then, the appropriations articles. Uh, uh, each of those programs was discussed in, in uh, uh, Ms. Beckel's uh, uh, spreadsheet. And then the repeals in uh, Section 37 the, the, uh, relate to the compensatory revenue changes for the uh, hold harmless provisions going forward that were part of the governor's revised recommendations and to the repeal of the exception to the uh, uh, unemployment insurance uh, as part of the package that Representative Greenman brought forward. 
Uh, Madam Chair and members, that's Article 1. Great. Are there any questions from any of the members? Representative Cresha? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Strunk, on these uh, Section 25, can you just walk me through how that's different than what's happening today in schools? Because schools do have some unemployment they're paying for a trust, but how does this differ? I'm going to get these questions when I leave committee, so I'd like to be able to answer those back to the schools. Yeah, absolutely. Madam Chair, Representative Cresha, under current law, prior to any changes, school districts may levy for any of their qualifying unemployment insurance costs. So if they uh, uh, lay off an employee that qualifies for unemployment insurance, that amount goes into the, uh, into the levy authority for the school district. School districts are essentially reimbursable employees on that, or employers on that. So they essentially, uh, uh, whatever bill they get for unemployment insurance for, for laying off teachers or other staff uh, goes on to the levy. And there's an annual levy in the low millions of dollars most years. It's been as high as, I think, $11 million a few years back. Uh, but that levy authority is available to school districts. That's the current law situation. On the unemployment uh, side, under current law, hourly workers during the summer term are not eligible, uh, generally speaking, for unemployment insurance. So that's the, that's the two current law setups there. The changes proposed in the DE1 uh, take away the exemption for the hourly workers so that they are eligible for the period of time over the summer term. So an hourly worker laid off over the summer term would be eligible essentially for unemployment insurance. So that change is, is in the language. Then on the levy, the levy is changed so that the levy only applies to the workers that are currently covered and does not include the hourly employee, the cost of the hourly employee's uh, uh, summer unemployment insurance. So the levy essentially functions as it did before, covering the employees as it did before, uh, but now the hourly workers are eligible for unemployment insurance during the summer term. Uh, so that's the K-12 effects, and essentially then the appropriation for the three agencies is the estimate from the fiscal note of what those agencies would face in terms of the, uh, the reimbursement costs through the unemployment insurance system. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Uh, Lead Cresha? Yep, and just quick, thank you for that. And so a quick follow-up. So if uh, this is the proposed change, right now, uh, let's just take this bill out for a second. School districts do have a, uh, they cover the liability for unemployment. And I think they have a special arrangement that's different than other uh, businesses. Could you just speak to that, just so I have the full... Madam, Madam Mr. Chair, Strong. Representative Cresha, most employers are subject to an employer tax for purposes of unemployment insurance. That's what pays into the fund for most employers. School districts are in a category of employer that are allowed to pay on a reimbursement basis. So whatever amount of unemployment insurance is generated by their employees, that amount is paid by the school district. So they're what's called a reimbursable employer, not an employer subject to the tax rate. Uh, so school districts would continue in that category and they would be required to pay the unemployment insurance costs into the UI system for the costs that they're being charged for unemployment insurance. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Strom. Lead Cresha, follow up? Thanks for the clarification. Any further questions? Great. You may continue, Mr. Strom. Oh, Ms. Para. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I will be walking through articles two through six. Um, so just pausing in between for questions. Article two is the education excellence article, and most of this language is coming from the policy bill. Um, so the um, House Bill 1269, the first engrossment, and I'll, um, I'll really just be kind of highlighting where sections were merged with other bills or, or things that might be a little bit different. Um, uh, section four, um, uh, the academic standards, that includes the changes mm -hmm. Um, from the policy bill with math to math, um, uh, the art standards and phi ed standards, and it also includes ethnic studies in the social studies standards. Um, section seven, uh, the graduation requirements has the math changes, um, the civics changes, um, the arts, the phi ed changes, and also requires a half credit in personal finance. Section eight is the credit equivalencies. 
Um, that has the agriculture program name changes from the policy bill as well as um, the ethnic studies uh, credit equivalencies. Section 13 um, has the definition of ethnic studies and then other references to ethnic studies in the bill key off of that definition and, and this definition reflects what was adopted in, in committee in, in an amendment. Um, uh, section 14 has the ethnic studies requirements and again just keying back off uh, section the section 13 definition. Section 14 is the Holocaust and genocide education language. Um, sections 16 through 22 um, are all from the uh, policy bill um, uh, mostly relating to uh, the standardized testing. Section uh, 23 has the MTSS and COMPASS language from the governor's bill, uh, governor's budget bill, I mean. Sections 24 to 39 um, are all student discipline provisions from the, uh, from the policy bill, um, generally relate to non-exclusionary uh, discipline, um, uh, dismissal of students in kindergarten through grade three, um, uh, the written notice of uh, intent to dismiss a student, um, and so on. Section 40 has the training requirements for uh, paraprofessionals, and that is um, eight hours rather than the 16 um, that was heard in committee, and that's in a, um, the language is in a standalone sections rather than what you'll see later in the um, um, special ed section. Sections 41 to 48 are all from the policy bill, um, they generally relate to open enrollment, uh, PSEO, online instruction, and extended year programming. Section 49 is the full service community schools uh, uh, change to the statute. That was from the governor's budget bill. Madam Chair. Representative. Ms. Parrott, would you slow down just a I'm little so bit? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will slow down. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Parrott. Um, and I'm happy to go back to any particular section. Um, uh, <laughs> section 49 uh, is, is the full service community schools. Um, that, so that modifies the statute, the programming requirements, um, and, the, and the amounts that schools would get. And that's from the governor's budget bill. Um, sections 50 to 54 um, all came from the policy bill. They modify um, achievement and integration, the adult basic education, um, minimum age, and um, uh, something called SLIFE, which is students with limited or interrupted formal education, um, uh, modifies the, that definition. Section 55 requires paraprofessionals to uh, work with students with disabilities to get time to review a student's IEP um, within five days of beginning to work alone with an individual student. Uh, section 56 modifies PELRA, which is the Public Employment Labor Relations Act. Um, that is from the policy bill as well. Um, and uh, that modifies the definition of, of public employee. Sections 57 to 60 are uncoded. Um, the, those are the Ethnic Studies Working Group, the Computer Science Education Advancement Program, and the pilot program um, involving Pillsbury. Uh, the uh, two tiny cha two changes there, um, clarifying the, that the, it's only high schools that participate in, in that pilot, and um, that the schools are required to administer the MCAs. Um, and then also the um, included in number 60 is the Genocide and Holocaust Education Working Group. Section 61 is the appropriations that Ms. Beckel walked you through. Section 62 is um, a reviser instruction um, uh, regarding uh, statutes in Chapter 120B. And Section 63 is the repealer. Um, and both the, the reviser instruction and the repealer came from the policy bill. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from any members? Uh, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, not a question, but here's a suggestion to help us um, when we're going through like this. If you, when you say like uh, section 20, if you could just refer to a line quickly too, like line such and such, that helps us jump to that section. Uh, my eyes don't always catch the sections as I'm flipping through, so just 
if you can throw out the line number two uh, for whoever's going through them, that might be helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Representative Sensimer? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question about, um, for the Ethnic Studies Bill, there was two positions at MDE that were part of that bill, and I'm not seeing that included here, and I'm wondering if I'm missing it. Chair Yuki? Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think um, we um, funded it differently through the departments asked and their equity, diversion, and inclusion. So we bumped up their positions there, but we can double check. Maybe Ms. Para just has a better memory than I do on that. Thank you, Chair Yuki. Ms. Para? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. E yes, that, that is correct. And the, um, the EDI, the Ethnic Diversity and Inclusion uh, piece for the department will be in Article 12, state agencies. Follow-up questions, Ms. Amira? Um, have we confirmed with MDE that that's where they want those positions? Um, Chair Yuki. Um, Chair Clardy, I, I will do that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Great. Did you want to continue, Ms. Pera? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Article 3, um, which is on page uh, 123, um, that all the language in Article 3 is from, from the Read Act, House File 629. Um, there are some changes, including the, um, the advisory council is, is no longer there. Um, but it's generally all from that bill. So, um, Madam Chair, that's that article. If anybody has any specific questions about it, I can answer those. Do we have any questions on Article 3? Okay, seeing none, please proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, Article 4 is American Indian education. Um, and the, all, the whole article, um, it all came from the policy bill. Well, most of it came from the policy bill, as well as the governor's bill. And there was um, significant overlap with uh, House file um, 1875, um, Representative Keeler's bill. Um, so uh, sections one, section one is, is on page 142 is the, is the data sharing provision. Section two on page 144, line 20, is the Indigenous Peoples Day in, in school observation. Section uh, three, uh, on page 145, line uh, 14, um, includes representatives from uh, Tribal Nations Education Committee um, and Tribal Nations and Communities uh, in the development of standards. Um, section four on page 146, line three, is the review of academic standards. Um, and it uh, requires um, um, embedding indigenous education for all students um, on line 140. 6.6, um, and also on 147.19 is, is the requirement to embed ethnic studies as related to academic standards during the review of, of standards. Section five uh, on 147.23 is the indigenous education for all uh, students, um, and that's um, this is still in the academic standards section. Section six on page 148, line 11, um, is the American Indian mascots uh, prohibition. Section seven, um, uh, line 149.12, is the Minnesota Indian Teacher Training Program account. Section eight on 149.25 is um, the definition of American Indian student. Section nine on 149.28 um, uh, is the... Uh, American, these are all in the American Indian Education um, sections, the next few sections. Um, uh, section 13 is the American Indian Education Program Coordinators. Um, section 14 uh, on page 151, line 28, is the Parent Indian, I'm sorry, American Indian Parents of Community Participation um, language. That was all from the Governor's uh, Bill. Section 15 is the duties of the American Indian Education Director. Uh, 
No, I'm sorry, that's section 16. Section 15 is, is the commissioner providing technical assistance. Um, section 17 on page 155, line 11, is the graduation ceremonies language, allowing students to wear uh, tribal regalia. Um, section 18 is American Indian Education Aid, um, and this was all from the governor's <laughs> bill. Um, there is an addition, let me see, um, page 156, line 21. That's the carry forward of funds. Um, uh, and I, I forget what bill that was from. House file 1963. Um, section 19 is um, uh, online learning students. Um, that is also from the governor's budget bill. Section 20 is um, allowing American Indian students to carry um, uh, a medicine pouch with uh, loose tobacco. And sections 21 is all the appropriations, and that's Article 4. Thank you, Ms. Para. Any questions on that section? Okay, seeing none, you can continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, article 5 is the teacher's article. And... Um, Article 5 is also largely from the, um, from the policy bill, um, and I'll just mostly be highlighting where language was combined with language from other bills. Um, section 1 um, on page, and this starts on page 160, um, this is the um, uh, e-learning days from the policy bill requiring um, meeting and negotiating um, with, with teachers regarding the e-learning plan. Section two um, is uh, increasing the percentage of teachers of color. This is from House File 320. Um, section three um, on curriculum, this is slightly different from what the committee heard. This uh, was carried in the policy bill as well as House File 320. And rather than requiring a, a district to adopt a, a policy, um, it prohibits um, the district or charter school from discriminating against or disciplining a teacher for incorporating into curriculum contributions of persons in protected classes as long as the contribution is aligned with uh, state standards and benchmarks. Um, section four, um, okay, section four, sections four to 31 are, um, from, the, are it's from the policy bill. Um, uh, relating to definitions um, in the teacher licensing chapter. Um, so those start on page 162, um, line one. Um, those are all definitions going through uh, 163.14 for purposes of licensure. Um, section uh, 13 on page 163.15 um, uh, requiring uh, the board to approve teacher preparation providers uh, preparing teachers for licensure. Sections, um, section 14, um, uh, again, relating to uh, Pelsby's duties. Um, and and the, this is the list of persons registered. Section 15 modifies the list of statutes that Pelsby adopts rules for. Section 16 um, is a technical change section, uh, and I should mention, a, a number of these make a technical change, changing from candidate to applicant. Section 17 um, uh, is um, teacher preparation performance data. This is a report that the, that the providers um, include in one change from what was heard in committee. Um, currently, um, the providers uh, report uh, students' pass rates on, on the licensing exams, because those exams are um, uh, generally eliminated for students that go through the Minnesota programs, that reporting is, um, it's struck out on page 166, line 29. Section 18 is teacher preparation program reporting. And again, um, because, because the licensure tests, um, uh, Minnesota program grads don't have to take those anymore, the reporting is struck out here on page 168, line nine. Section 19 uh, modifies the reference to the school speech language pathologists. Um, section 20, um, 
Section 20 is a technical change. Section 21 changes the statute, corrects the statutory reference. Um, section 22 um, uh, is the licensure of your portfolio, and that's just for tier three here, or to add a field for tier three or four. Um, section 23 on page 170, line 22, is the what's called the star reporting. Uh, and so that says there what, what data Pelsby has to collect. Section 24. Um, is we're getting into the tiered licensure changes here, and then this is 171.1. Um, this one is, is mostly technical. Um, it's uh, uh, saying that the application um, has to be submitted jointly, uh, be paid for. Um, section 25 um, is a technical change. Section 26 um, is a new subdivision um, that expands the exemptions from the bachelor's degree. Um, currently, those are just CTE teachers. This adds oral language and performing arts. Section 27 on page 172, um, uh, it strikes the language that allows the board to submit written comments to district um, regarding the tier one applications. Section 28 allows Pelsby to review the applications earlier. Section 29. Um, allows a tier one teacher to be in the same bargaining unit as other teachers. Um, section 30, these are now the tier two licensure changes uh, starting on page 173, line 25. Um, and this, um, this was what was heard in committee except that, um, uh, I'm sorry, it was what was heard in committee but it combines provisions from two, from two different bills, from the policy bill as well as another bill. <clears throat> and because the coursework um, subdivision is repealed later on, um, on page 174, line 21, where there was previously a reference to completing the coursework, um, it now says completed a state approved teacher preparation program. Section 31 is new, is a new uh, subdiv subdivision um, expanding again um, the exemptions from the bachelor's degree to include um, uh, performing or visual arts and world languages. <clears throat> Section 32 is legacy language. Um, given the changes in tier, uh, in tier to tier two, this allows uh, folks who got the license when they, they met the requirements um, to keep renewing the license even though they would not meet the requirements for a new license. So that's uh, for several years. Section 33 um, allows, um, there's a couple of provisions here that allow um, Pelsby to begin to review um, applications earlier. Um, section 34, we start the tier three licensure changes and that's on at the top of page 176. Um, so <coughs> this, one, this section um, amends the requirements um, as I mentioned, there are several changes to the licensure exams later. Um, uh, this came from the policy bill. But, um, it allows uh, a person who graduated from a minority serving institution, um, such as a historically black college and university, to obtain a license as long as they've completed um, student teaching expectations um, without taking the licensure exams. Section 35 um, on the top of page 177, um, this, um, uh, on page 177, line 13, um, that strikes the language that allows somebody with a tier two license, um, uh, that's been on a tier two for three years and hasn't been put on an improvement process to move, uh, to tier three. So that's struck and, um, I'll get to the legacy language in a minute. Um, section 36, ex again, expands that exemption from the bachelor's degree. <coughs> section uh, 37 on page 178 um, is that legacy language um, allowing somebody to, from, to move from tier two to tier three um, until December 31, 2026. Section 38 starts the tier four changes and that's on page 178, line 14. Um, uh, it strikes, um, one of the requirements for tier four currently is that somebody's, as a candidate's most recent summative evaluation, not place them on improvement process. So that is struck, but it does require, and it adds a requirement and said that the applicant who's coming in with a tier three have completed the renewal requirements. 
Section 39 is the tier life, uh, I'm sorry, is the exam changes. Um, and these uh, were what was heard in, in policy. Um, so uh, these are the changes to the skills exams, um, which was previous, is currently for just for a tier four. Um, uh, it modifies the requirements for the pedagogy and content exams. Um, and uh, it strikes the requirement for uh, the reading instruction exam. And requires um, accommodations for, for the exams that uh, people are required, to, candidates are required to take. Section 40, um, uh, because the Minnesota programs are no, th those students are no longer required to take the exams, um, uh, language is struck relating to that on, starting on 180.14. Section 41 uh, strikes language um, uh, re that requires uh, current candidates <coughs> to provide experience of, of teaching or administrative experience. Section 42 um, requires teachers renewing any license um, uh, uh, to, to include in their renewal requirements cultural heritage and contemporary con contributions of American Indians. Um, and this, uh, I believe, was in the governor's bill. Section 43 is a technical change. Section 44 on page 181, line 27, allows ABE and ECFE teachers to get tenure or continuing contract. Uh, section 45, uh, sections 45 and 50 are from House File 320, requiring districts to report hires and terminations to Pelsby by race and ethnicity. Um, section 46 is from the policy bill, modifying the probationary period for teachers. Sections uh, 47 and... Uh, Sorry, 47 and 49 are from the policy bill modifying the teacher evaluation process. Um, section 48, again, is the probationary period change. Uh, section uh, 50, I just went through. Section 51 adjusts the, um, this is the QCOMP statute, and it adjusts the for the pupil units in future years. <laughs> Section 52 on page 192 is the short call substitute pilot program. Section 53, uh, 55, and 57 all came from House File 320. Um, and these modify the Come Teach in Minnesota hiring bonuses, the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educator of Color program, um, and the Teacher Mentorship Statute. Um, section 58. Four on page 194, line 29, is the um, Heritage, Language, and Culture Teacher Statute, um, the, the licensure pathway. Section uh, 56 on page 200, line 16, um, uh, is the student teachers, so it no longer requires them to complete two years in an approved preparation program to do their student teaching. Um, section... Seven, uh, sections 58, 59, and 60 modify the Grow Your Own uh, programs. Um, and these are from the governor's budget bill. Section 61, starting on page 206, line 6, is the Special Education Teacher Pipeline Program, um, modified to give priority um, to, for training to allow participants holding a tier one or tier two special education license to obtain a tier three uh, license. Section 62 is from the governor's, uh, I'm sorry, it's from, um, it's from the policy bill um, modifying the principal evaluations. Section 63 on page 208, line 13, um, establishes the student support personnel aid um, and subdivision four on page 209, line 15, has the, um, uh, basically how it's calculated for each district, uh, charter school and cooperative. It's a specific allowance per pupil. Um, section 61, I'm sorry, is that where I am? No, section 64 uh, and 65 are from the policy bill. Both of these um, amend PELRA. Uh, section 64 modifies the definition of teacher um, to include um, uh, uh, 
people creating and delivering instruction to children in a pre-K or early learning program. Um, section 65 uh, modifies the subjects of bargaining to include class sizes, student testing, and student personnel ratios. Um, section 66 and 67 are the appropriations that Ms. Beckel walked you through. Section 68 is the reviser instruction, um, and section 69 is a repealer that was in the uh, policy bill. Madam Chair, that is Article 5. <laughs> Any questions on Article 5, reps? You may continue. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Article 6 is entirely from the policy bill, so um, I, I will kind of gloss over that here. Um, it, um, it has um, definitions. It includes, um, I'm sorry, it, it uh, clarifies the statutes that charter schools are subject to, has a definition of market need and demand, and includes those at various stages um, and modifies the charter school uh, admissions uh, section, uh, among others. And Madam Chair, that's Article 6. Questions? Great, Mr. Strom. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pira, for your hard work. Madam Chair, members, Article 7 is the special education article, and that starts on page 230. Uh, on line 24 on page 230. In this article are a series of provisions from the finance and policy bills, as well as a number of individual bills that were heard in this committee. Sections 1, 2, 6, and 7 are all related to, or uh, I'm sorry, 6, 7, and 8 are all related to the change of age for uh, the length of service for children with a disability. Uh, uh, the governor proposed standardizing that uh, age to the uh, uh, 22nd birthday, essentially, and finishing then the, the time following in school from the 22nd birthday. So those amounts are, are, those sections are spread throughout the bill. They're in a variety of different uh, uh, statutes, one, two, six, seven, and eight in the sections here. And Ms. Beckel <laughs> talked about the fiscal impact of those uh, in, in Article One primarily. Starting on section three on page 231, line 23, uh, this was the uh, bill that Representative Becker Finn brought for the interpreters for the uh, students who are uh, 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 in need of RID interpretive services. Uh, uh, section four is uh, from House File 562 in the due process aid. That's on page 233, line 7, where that starts. Uh, uh, the big change are the amounts have been adjusted since that bill was presented to the committee. And you'll, you'll see those changes primarily on, uh, on the bottom of page 233 and 234 to match the appropriation uh, and the hours of service that are, are, are now required. So you'll see that hours of service is online uh, on Let's see here. Oh, that's a fraction. I'm not seeing it. But Madam Chair, that's uh, that that hours of service is is on page two. Oh, there we are, 234, line eight. So the requirement is the 43.75 hours of service. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, uh, the governor, uh, starting on uh, page 234, line 21, uh, the governor proposed using the homeless and highly mobile transportation category for foster students as well. That provision was included in the bill. Then jumping ahead past the next three uh, provisions that change the age to 22 to section 9, which is on page 241, starting on line 10. This is the language from the policy bill regarding the uh, uh, restrictive procedures. That's unchanged from how it was uh, brought to this committee. Section 10, starting on page 247, line 27, is the uh, 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 Early Childhood Special Education School of Parent Choice. That language, as was pointed out in the 
uh, in the uh, policy bill was changed slightly from the governor's language. So the choice for the non-resident parent is the same as for a resident parent. Um, there are three provisions then starting on, line, on page 249, line 7. All three of these have to do when a child is placed in another district and these provisions make clear that if the family of the child who's placed chooses an online option, that the education could be provided through an online option. Madam Chair, members, uh, starting on page 252, uh, line 6, is section 14. Uh, this is Representative Jordan's bill regarding the uh, homeless transportation. As we discussed that day, the uh, Transportation formula, uh, whether homeless and highly mobile transportation is 100% funded, depends upon which of the three transportation calculations the district is subject to. Uh, uh, this, this provision would make sure that that transportation is 100% funded regardless of which of the categories the district is in. Section 15 changes the cross-subsidy uh, uh, percentage to 47.8. Currently, cross-subsidy aid is paying 6.43% of the cross-subsidy. On page 253, you can see that the cross-subsidy percentage goes to 47.8%. Uh, Section 16, starting on page 254, is the uh, complementary piece to the change uh, section prior for homeless transportation. Uh, then uh, section 17, beginning on page 254, line 24, is a new codified program from the governor's uh, uh, bill that would provide uh, ongoing grant amounts for the sites that provide level four special education uh, funding to students if that's provided at an intermediate school district, uh, education district, or other cooperative facility. Madam Chair, members, then section 18, starting on page 255, line nine, is the uh, uh, amendment uh, having to do with the uh, um, third party billing. The new language appears on page 257. And essentially what this provision would do would allow school districts to count the time of the school social workers for purposes of medical assistance for the third party uh, uh, billing procedures. Uh, section 19, starting on the next page on page 258. Uh, is the process uh, uh, preceding rulemaking and the rulemaking that the department uh, is uh, proceeding uh, ahead with to change the special education disability category, which is currently defined as specific learning disability. Uh, this language you, you heard earlier, but essentially what's, what's happening here is the department's going to go through a process and then uh, uh, go to rulemaking after that process for a new rule. Uh, section 20 is the appropriations section, and I believe those were all covered uh, uh, in Ms. Beckel's spreadsheet and no specific writers uh, of note in, in those appropriations. Any questions? Madam Great, Chair, members, section 9, or article 9 is, or 8, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Skipping ahead, I'm afraid. Article 8 is the facilities article. This starts on page 260. And uh, the first 10 sections of the bill all have to do with the long-term facilities maintenance uh, 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 program. Uh, uh, two specific sets of changes that are, are made to this program in LTFM, and many of the changes are clarifying only uh, eliminating obsolete language. But let me highlight those those two changes that uh, uh, are of, of uh, substantive importance. Those are sections 2 and 3, uh, beginning on 262.10. Uh, I'm sorry, sections uh, uh, 3 and uh, uh, section 3, beginning on 262.19. Uh, this would allow uh, uh, cooperative units, including joint powers, uh, to be included in a school district's LTFM uh, 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 plan so that their facilities for these joint powers uh, 
uh, could be uh, covered in the in the same manner as other cooperatives. This was the bill that Representative Purcell brought to the committee. The remainder of the changes then on L, on long-term facilities maintenance revenue have to do with uh, uh, the gender neutral single uh, user restroom provisions. There's not an increase in LTFM funding, nor is there a requirement uh, uh, for the LTFM funding to be used for these uh, uh, facility modifications, but instead these modifications are an allowable use of LTFM revenue, and these modifications also need to be mentioned in the plan, uh, but only to be mentioned. They're not required as a part of the plan. Uh, the the long-term facilities maintenance plan rather just requires that the school district consider uh, uh, its its current uh, position uh, and facility setup with the, with regard to gender neutral uh, single user restrooms. So those those ten sections, Madam Chair, all work together, uh, and that brings us down to uh, I believe page two sixty six. And uh, 266, line 2, is another provision related to the uh, uh, facilities. All school districts are required uh, uh, for, uh, for most building projects to go through a review and comment with the Department of Education uh, for any construction over $2 million a year. The new language on lines 266.21 to 23 uh, require that those plans uh, uh, describe whether the projects are making uh, accommodation for gender neutral single user restrooms, locker room, privacy stalls, or other privacy features as a part of the, uh, as a part of the review and comment process. Uh, then in the next section, in section 12, uh, uh, this provision was also from House File 2925. The operating capital list is explicitly amended to ensure that these uh, uh, gender neutral single user restrooms, other locker room privacy stalls, and other uh, uh, privacy features are an allowable use of the existing uh, uh, operating capital money. Uh, Madam Chair, members, section 13 uh, beginning on 269.12. Uh, um, is the uh, uh, lease levy authority. Currently, uh, school districts have an authority on the lease levy of $212 per pupil, and uh, uh, there are lease authority for uh, uh, intermediate school districts. This is adding other cooperative units as well to the, to the lease levy so that the school districts may include in their costs for the other cooperatives, the the lease facility costs up to up to that uh, cap. Um, then, Madam Chair, members, uh, section 14 at the bottom of page 271 with the new language on lines 272.27 and 28. This requires that any projects that are done with the uh, through the uh, special authority given to districts for lease purchase for installment buys for those districts. Uh, 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 that uh, listed on 272.12 forward, that their projects are also subject to review and comment by the Department of Education. Section 15 uh, uh, is the Safe Schools Revenue. Uh, the chair will be familiar with that language. On 274.3 and 4 is the uh, addition of uh, any cybersecurity measures, including insurance costs, to the uh, amounts that are allowable uses uh, for the safe schools levy. There's a separate provision uh, for one-time uh, grants later in the bill, but this essentially is including in the current levy authority uh, those costs as an eligible use. Uh, section 16, starting on 274.19, is the Eastern Carver County uh, uh, a transportation hub that this committee heard. Uh, section 17, starting on 274.29, is the adjustment for the school districts that bought big box stores to convert to learning space and uh, uh, encountered uh, a change in the air handling status. This, this essentially, uh, uh, the two committees, or the two districts that presented at the committee were Moorhead and Fergus Falls being affected by 
by uh, 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 the change in the long-term facilities maintenance. Uh, then on 275.13 in the appropriations, uh, uh, these are primarily the uh, uh, base appropriations that Ms. Solvay mentioned, plus the building and cybersecurity grants on line 275.19 of $35 million on a one-time basis for the grants. And then the ongoing funding of grants for gender neutral single user restrooms on uh, beginning on 276.10 of a million dollars per year. Uh, Madam Chair, that's the facilities article. Questions on Article 8? Great, you may proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, members, the next article stop, starts at the page, uh, uh, top of page 277. Uh, this is Article 9, combines nutrition and libraries. Uh, 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 sections uh, uh, 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, and uh, or three, uh, and 3 were all as a part of the policy bill that came to this committee and were discussed then. Uh, section, or 1, 2, and 4, I'm so sorry. Section 3, beginning on page 278.22, includes the early childhood special education uh, uh, children in the state's access to the school breakfast program. Uh, then there's a series of changes in, in, uh, to libraries in section five, beginning on page 280.6. Uh, uh, the school libraries and media centers are defined in statute. Uh, in section six, toward the bottom of that page, the word citizen is placed with resident for library services. And on uh, section seven, at the very bottom of the page, the, the renamed services to people with visual and physical <coughs> disabilities, the, the national name changed of the organization and that change is reflected there. The next several changes accompany a funding change for the uh, regional library basic grant program. That that program provides money to the regional library systems. As Ms. Beckel mentioned, the funding is increased by slightly more than $2 million uh, per year. And the library, uh, regional library system brought to this committee a proposal to change how that's allocated amongst the 12 regional <coughs> systems. Uh, those changes are included in uh, uh, sections uh, 10, 11, and uh, 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 12. Sections 13 and 14, beginning in the middle of page 283, are our first chance to uh, amend laws that have already passed this year. In the school lunch and breakfast programs, uh, the bill passed uh, uh, and was enacted, and then the subsequent forecast change to the underlying base came out. So the adjustments you see here include the amounts in Representative Jordan's bill that was enacted and then adjusted to reflect the, the February forecast data. And finally, Madam Chair, the last section in the nutrition article is, or I'm sorry, there are two sections left. There's the appropriations section, which we've discussed, and then the reviser instructions starting on the top of page 285, which uh, replaces in casual use throughout the statute where the term free and reduced price lunch or breakfast is used, replaces that with free or reduced price meals. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Questions, members? Go ahead, Mr. Strom. Uh, Madam Chair, members, the next article is Article 10, the early education article. There's just uh, four sections in this bill. Uh, uh, mo as the committee is aware, most of the early childhood provisions are riding with that bill on Representative Pinto's committee. The big change in this committee is on page 285, line uh, uh, 22. And here what's happening is that the, uh, the, there are uh, currently two categories of students, um, uh, statutory categories of students eligible for VPK, the voluntary pre-kindergarten program. 3,160 students are in the first category and their, their uh, seats in those programs are ongoing. Uh, another 4,000 <coughs> students you can see on the language on 285.21 uh, starting in line uh, or in, in fiscal year 2019 have been renewed every two years and that was for an additional 4,000 seats. Uh, this provision makes those 4,000 seats ongoing starting in 2024, 
and then in 2025 adds another 5,200 uh, seats to the total. Uh, so that starting in fiscal year 25, there would be a total of 12,360 participants eligible for the voluntary pre-kindergarten program. As Ms. Beckel mentioned as, uh, as we walked through the spreadsheet, the funding for voluntary pre-kindergarten, because these are counted as pupil units, is primarily contained in Article I in general education revenue. So there are the adjustments that are on the front page uh, to general education funding uh, for these additional pupils. The, the total cost is summarized on Ms. Beckel's spreadsheet, but essentially the change here is 4,000 pupils ongoing and an addition, starting in 24 and an additional 5,200 pupils ongoing uh, or uh, participants ongoing starting in, uh, in fiscal year 25. And the next three sections just correspond to the other changes to this ongoing uh, additional VPK pupil count. Any questions? Madam Chair, members, <laughs> Article 11 starts on the bottom of page 288. And uh, the first uh, uh, two sections reflect an increase in basic community education revenue from $5.42 to $5.75. Uh, the increase is done entirely in uh, state aid for those programs. Section three, beginning on page 289.13, is the after school learning language. This is a combination of the language a Representative Lee brought to the committee and the governor's language and is accompanied by the grants that uh, uh, you saw on Ms. Beckel's spreadsheet. Uh, sections uh, four and five are the adult basic education sections. These start on, line, on page 291. And essentially, the, uh, the two changes uh, keep the uh, adult basic education revenue, statewide revenue amount from declining should contact hours drop statewide. Uh, it's a 10-year average. That, that's used, so there would be no decline in the overall funding. Um, and then the second change in section uh, 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 five uh, uh, increases the amount uh, uh, per contact hour so that it can be up to $30 per contact hour before uh, essentially there's a cap on the contact hour uh, funding portion of that formula. Uh, section six in the middle of page 292 is the governor's recommendation for the high school equivalency tests and funded in the same way the governor proposes. Then the next uh, uh, section, section seven, was Representative Hill's bill regarding the Adults with Disabilities program. Uh, currently, that's a, a frozen grant of, of aid and a frozen levy amount for the qualifying districts. Uh, this provision uh, qualifies all districts for adults with disabilities revenue and sets that revenue at 35 cents per capita of the school district, of all the, all the uh, residents of that school district, not just the, the students, um, uh, with a corresponding levy adjustment as well. Um, and Madam Chair, member section 8 is at the bottom of... Uh, page 293, and here the, uh, in the Education Partnership Program, the names uh, were formerly Tier 1 and Tier 2 for the two different uh, categories. Uh, those names are proposed to change to the Neighborhood Partnership Grant and the Regional Neighborhood Partnership Grant. Um, and you'll see when we get to the appropriation section uh, uh, that there are riders for specific programs uh, in this biennium for the uh, uh, for the education partnership programs. Uh, starting on page 295, uh, you'll see the, uh, uh, 295.29, you'll see that seven uh, individual programs are listed each at $100,000 per year for the regional neighborhood partnerships. Uh, and Madam Chair members, that's the end of Article 11. Questions on Article 11? Zooming right along, <laughs> thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Perra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article 12 is the state agency's article, and that starts on page 296. Um, article sections 1, 2, and 3 are all from the uh, governor's budget bill. Uh, uh, section 
um, sections one and two um, both amend section 121A04 um, and require reporting on uh, participation in athletics by race and ethnicity. Section three requires reporting on use of reasonable force. Um, sections four to nine and 13 relate to Pelsby. So section four increases the number of members of the board. Section um, five modifies the, uh, the composition of the board. Section um, six modifies the compensation of the board members um, and switches to a stipend. Um, section seven um, uh, strikes obsolete language relating to Pelsby offices. Um, section eight uh, requires uh, Pelsby to reimburse local school districts for the cost of substitute teachers um, for Pelsby members um, when they're required to be away. Um, section nine um, uh, requires uh, the public employer of a Pelsby member to grant the member time off for board activities. Section 10 um, is uh, from the governor's uh, budget bill. It uh, relates to the state academy's uh, rental income. Section 11 establishes the office of the inspector general at the department. Section 12, um, this amends the 2021 um, laws and it, on page 302 at the top there, you'll see a new paragraph um, relating to the fiscal year 22 appropriation um, for uh, legal costs. Section 13, um, I mentioned before, is the Pelsby um, membership. It's transition language um, uh, uh, for the new, uh, for the changes to the, to the membership. Section 14 is the department's um, appropriations. So just a couple of things to highlight is the subdivision two is for the school mental health services lead. In subdivision three, um, you'll see, um, uh, for example, on page 303, line eight is for the Office of Inspector General. Um, section, subdivision four is for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Center staffing. And for subdivision five is the Unemployment Insurance Aid um, administration costs. Section 15 is the appropriation for the state academies. And again, you'll see the unemployment insurance costs on page 304, line 16. Same for Perpich um, in the next section, and that, that's on page 304, line 21. Um, and for Pelsby, uh, that's section 17. Those are the, um, those are the uh, appropriations for Pelsby. And Madam Chair, that's Article 12. Great, questions on Article 12. Madam Mr. Chair, Strong. members, Article 13 is the forecast adjustments that Chair Yukim brought to the committee last week. Those adjustments essentially uh, uh, reestablish the base for all of the programs that are driven by pupil units or otherwise change for forecast data. And those are included as they were brought to the committee in this bill. And that's it for Article 13. Questions? Chair Yukim. If there's no questions, I'll just close up. I know folks have to get to other meetings. Tomorrow we'll be doing uh, taking testimony. Thursday will be walk up, but uh, mark up. But uh, I just wanted to say, um, members, working in and for our schools is a labor of love for everyone involved. From our parents and teachers and administrators to our counselors, social workers, and school nurses, our school employees take care of all of our students' needs, from getting them to school, feeding why they're there, providing medical and emotional support, as well as cleaning up after them when they go home. Um, this entire bill is about investing in our future and in our Minnesota learners. Each of our schools across the state are as unique as the students that they serve. It is our job as legislators to make sure that every one of our public schools are healthy and safe learning environments for all of our kids. <coughs> It is our job to make sure that our districts have the stability, flexibility, and tools to meet our students where they're at. And it's our job to partner with our families and our communities to ensure that they have the tools to support our scholars so that they can reach their fullest potential. Members, I believe that this bill does that. It makes a historic investment in our schools, and I look forward to our discussion over the next few days. Representative Prisha. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, I just wanted to say before we go on in the next couple of days, and, and this gets to the House floor, um, by no means uh, do a, you know any of this should reflect on the work that has gone into it. It's a tremendous amount of work. And so everything from here on out will be policy discussions. And knowing from putting bills together and all the 
uh, all those that have been part of this. I just want to thank them for their work and thank them for their time and their sleepless nights um, because I know what it takes to get there. And this is a reflection of time, interests, passions, and visions. And now we get to talk about what it looks like going forward. So thank you, Chair Yuki. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, perfect comments. Not going to say anything else. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>